So, so I'm a researcher at MIT right now, um, but I actually started my studies in Canada, uh, heck, a decade ago, more than that. Um, and uh, I started work. I started working on exoplanets at the time, and what I did is. Um, I was really interested in small planets around bright stars, which really is what TESS is going to bring us thousands of. But at the time, there were two when I started my PhD. Uh, small planets transiting bright stars. Um, and the reason that we want them, so we want them to be transiting because that gives us the size of the planets. I'm sure you've heard this before. Uh, and we want them to be around bright stars because then we can measure the masses of those planets with uh, radio velocity. Uh, so those are the, the key things. Um, so. At the time, there were a lot of planets discovered with radio velocity, so we knew their masses, but we didn't know anything else about them except maybe their period. So uh, the way that people were finding transiting small planets uh, around bright stars is take the radio velocity planets and one by one see if any of them transit. Okay, so it's pretty painstaking. You have to like you know when it would transit because you know like if you have a star and a planet, and there's a planet going around the star. Um, at some point, you know, you know when it goes between the star and you, but it could be like down here, like this, or it could be like edge on, and then you might see a transit because it'll go exactly between uh, you and the star. Um, but because planets are kind of distributed all over the place, um, only one in 10 or even one in 100, depending on the period, uh, you might actually have one of those planets that, that transits, right? So you have to look at a whole bunch of systems uh, and then eventually you get lucky and find one. So I used this Canadian Space Telescope, which at the time was the only and the first. Um, Canadian Space Telescope is about the size of a suitcase that you could check in at the time. These days, I think you have to check in something smaller, um, probably a lot heavier than a suitcase. Yeah, about this big. Uh, it looks kind of like Spongebob. Uh, I should have I brought some visuals, but we um, didn't have time. <laughs> uh, it kind of looks like Spongebob. In fact, we use that a lot to kind of just show what it, uh, the size of and shape of it. Um, and, uh, and most is still up there, actually. It's flying in a, in a polar orbit around the Earth. Um, and what we did with most, uh, the size of the telescope itself, the, the glass part, was uh, just a little bit bigger than the test cameras, so about six inches in diameter. Um, and what we did is we took these radio velocity planets one by one, observed at a time when we expected a transit, if it transited, um, and just stared at the star and looked for a dip. And we actually found um, the two super Earths, I think up until a few years ago, there were the two super Earths transiting the brightest stars uh, around which we know of a transiting super Earth. Um, one is 55 Cancri E, if you've heard about it. The other one is uh, HD 97658B. Uh, you don't need to you know, know these names, but um, these are actually the two super Earths that have been studied for the longest time with the most telescopes because they orbit stars that are really bright, really nearby to us. Um, and we can actually learn a lot about their atmospheres and we already knew their masses and, and, and sizes from the uh, transit and radio velocity observations that I mentioned. Um, so that was really slow. It took about five years to find those two transiting super Earths around bright stars. Um, and now they tell me this testing is just gonna find thousands. Like, what was all that work for, you know? Uh, but we, we, actually, we actually were able to learn a lot about these small planets from these two, um, also from some of the brighter planets that Ke uh, Kepler found. Um, K2, uh, the new Kepler in a sense, is also finding uh, some small planets around bright stars. And these are all informing our understanding of small planets so that when we find test planets, we will know better which ones to pick for follow-up observations uh, with the James Webb and other kinds of telescopes with which we will look at the atmospheres. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about tests. I'm especially interested in those planets right in between the size of Earth and Neptune. Uh, one, because we don't have any planets like that in the solar system, uh, so these super Earths have Neptunes. And I'm actually really jealous because most stars seem to have one super Earth or sub Neptune, and we don't, it's not fair. Um, and uh, <laughs> because, because nature did, did something where um, just in that size range between Earth and Neptune is where you're transitioning from rocky to gaseous. 
and nature just thought it'd be funny not to uh, have, not to give us one of those planets uh, that tells us about that transition and where it happens, uh, and just figure we'll just put put them around other stars so you guys can just find out the hard way. Um, so I'm really interested in that transition. How do you go from rocky to gaseous? Uh, is it does it depend on? Is it like a particular size, like Eliza said earlier? We do kind of know that planets bigger than 1.5 Earth radii generally are gaseous, and smaller than that generally are rocky. Um, that's all we can say so far. What I want to know is uh, those really like small but puffy ones and those big dense ones. Why are they outliers? Like, is there something about their star that's making those those planets not fit in with the rest of the distribution? Um, or is it just random? Hopefully not. It's probably not random, but I want to look for trends in the composition of those small planets as a function of how they formed and where they form. Um, and test by giving us both sizes um, and then with uh, follow-up observations, the masses of those planets will have all the information we need to actually start plotting, plotting up on a figure you know, masses and radii as a function of anything else we know about the planet, so we can figure out if there are any patterns in the composition of these small planets. Um, so yeah, that's my interest, super Earth uh, and some Neptunes, eventually habitable Earth, but uh, we're not quite there yet. So these super Earth and some Neptunes are what we're studying right now, and in the next decade, we're gonna start studying in more detail um, rocky planets, really small planets as well. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah. Why are you focusing on the size between Earth and Neptune? What is the reasoning for that? Right. So um, one reason is because that's where this transition between rocky and gaseous happens. And I want to understand uh, at what size or mass or around what kind of star does that transition happen. Um, the other reason is really just practical. Um, these are the planets that are more likely to have, uh, so sub-Neptunes will have a larger atmosphere than a rocky planet. And interestingly enough, the way that we look at the atmospheres of these planets uh, these days is using transmission spectroscopy. So you're looking through the atmosphere of the planet. You get uh, light from the star, goes through the planet's atmosphere and comes to us. So we get that light with a spectrum of the planet's atmosphere imprinted on it, and that's how we know what's in the atmosphere. Um, the bigger that atmosphere is, the better signal we get, right? So if you can think of, about it the other way, so if you take Earth, no light goes through the Earth. Um, or, or a rocky planet with no atmosphere, no light goes through because it's just rock, it blocks all the light. If you have a little bit of atmosphere around that planet, you'll get a little bit of a signal, uh, but it's still gonna be pretty tiny and hard to detect. If you have a lot of atmosphere, uh, you can get more signal, you can better see what's inside the atmosphere. So it's a bit of a catch-22 where we really want to study small, rocky planets, but it's easier to study puffier uh, planets with bigger atmospheres. So it's really just a stepping stone to eventually understanding smaller planets. <coughs> yeah? What's the latest theory regarding some of these uh, retrograde hot Jupiters? Like if you were teaching an astronomy class, how would you... Um, that's come up in, in right. our class. And Well, so there are a couple of theories. One is that uh, those Jupiters may have had a um, complicated dynamical history. So um, at some point during their formation, probably their migration from farther in the disk, in the, in the protoplanetary disk, close to their stars, um, they just got hit by other planets, um, had various interactions maybe even with the whole star that kind of sent them in this crazy orbit. Um, but so that that would be the main idea. Um, it's a little difficult to confirm that because we don't know what these systems were like when they were young. So one way to do it is to study younger systems um, and see, so basically study st systems that are, you know, just formed systems that are like middle age, teenage systems, etc. Uh, so we can hope to maybe yeah, eventually piece together by studying these different age systems how this dynamical process happens. Um, but I guess the answer really is we're not sure yet. Yep. So for the um, spectral analysis that you want to do in the mm -hmm. future, is there another mission plan for that or is it something you're going to be doing from Earth? Where are you going to get the data for the spectral analysis? That's a great question. So, 
Yeah, so, so James Webb, everyone talks about James Webb because it's going to be the most sensitive one that's coming up soon. Um, but we can actually observe the atmospheres of some of those planets, even with ground-based telescopes like uh, Magellan and the Keck and, you know, things that are uh, four, five, six, ten meters in size. Um, I've actually observed the atmosphere of a planet and found scattering, like really scattering in that atmosphere. So it's not exactly like a molecule, but it's a, it's a something that we see in a spectrum uh, using one inch meter telescopes. So pretty small by astro astronomical standards telescopes on the ground. Uh, so it's possible to do some of this work with a smaller telescopes if you can just get enough data. Now, James Webb really will make the biggest dent in, in, in progress in this direction. Uh, there's also a mission uh, that was recently approved called Ariel, and that's a European agency, space agency mission. Um, and that mission is gonna be kind of like James Webb, but smaller and exclusively focused on uh, looking at the atmospheres of exoplanets, no other, uh, no other astronomy. And that's a decade from now launch, so that'll be kind of the next one. Question here. Nice. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, yeah, so we saw um, visuals yesterday mm -hmm. of like, the viewing area of TESS, and they're at the two poles. It's going to be observing those stars for about a year. Do you think that um, the planets that we find in, in that continuous viewing area are going to be significantly different from what we found in Kepler because they're on an even longer period? Kepler has found even longer period planets than that. Um, so I'm glad you asked that though, because my interest is, you know, a lot of people are focusing on finding planets in the habitable zones of M dwarfs because they're easier to study. There's lots of good reasons to look for those. We also are a little concerned though that, you know, the activity from the star may not be um, good for life. So I'm interested in also not forgetting about looking for planets in the habitable zone of G, G and K, like bigger stars, stars that are closer to uh, in size and similarity to our sun. So I'm really hoping that planets around uh, in those in the poles uh, will be able to find planets in the habitable zone of slightly larger stars um, there. And uh, uh, how different they will be from the Kepler ones, we're not sure. We'll be able to get their masses, which is new, and look at their atmospheres, which is new. So let's see what the atmospheres of planets in the habitable zone of slightly larger stars look like as well. Okay, thank you so much. We have to